Alrighty, well this morning I'd like to begin by discussing how the Christian faith is perceived in our culture. We live in a day where I think Christians are challenged to the very core of our faith. This challenge isn't primarily about our theology or some specific point of doctrine, nor does it primarily about any specific behavior or lifestyle that we are for or against. I believe that the primary accusation against Christians in our day is that we are not loving. People might not express it in so few words, but if you boil down the vast majority of complaints against Christians in our culture, it comes down to this. Christians are viewed as unloving people. And this seems like a pretty damning indictment, especially when Jesus said that the greatest commandment out of all the laws given in Scripture is to love God with our everything and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Those who are truly transformed by the power of the gospel should see an increase in their love for God and an increase in their love for others, and that should be evident to everyone around us. But yet this accusation remains. We're told that we are not loving and we need to be more loving like the world is. We need to be less judgmental and more accepting and more open-hearted. How did the world become more loving than the church? Well, this is the topic we're going to be discussing today as we continue our series called One Point Wonders. And this series title is a play on the phrase One Hit Wonders, hence the album covers here on the stage. And those one hit wonders are those songs that you know that they get released, they become absolute smash hits. Everybody's singing it, but yet that artist can't seem to get another break. Some of my favorites, Take On Me by Aha, Take On Me. All you 80s people are like, yeah. Uh, My dad's favorite, Come On Eileen by Dex's Midnight Runners. Come on, Eileen. Oh, some Come On Eileen fans out there. Uh, Probably most famously, thanks to the whole Rick Rolling fiasco, Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. And if you've not heard that last one, there is an easy way for you to listen to it. Yeah, his parents are laughing. Matt, uh, who is one of our youth directors, uh, has a tattoo right on the back of his calf, uh, which if you scan it with your phone, your phone will start playing Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. (laughs) Why? Well, that's a conversation you'll have to have with Matt and his ever so proud parents. But in this series, we are looking at the four shortest books in the New Testament. They're not one-hit wonders in the sense that they are the only books written by the author. Last week, we looked at Philemon, written by the Apostle Paul, and he wrote a plethora of letters in the New Testament. This week, we're looking at 2 John, and it's called 2 John because... There was a first John. There's also a third John. That same John also wrote the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. He wrote quite a lot of the Bible. So these books aren't one-hit wonders, but they are one-point wonders. Each of the books we're looking at in this series contains only one chapter between 13 and 25 verses long, and each of these short passages makes one single point. If you look at some of the longer letters of the Bible, they will contain several different points and address lots of different topics. If you were to sit down, for example, and read the letter called 1 Corinthians, you would see a broad range of topics that are addressed by the Apostle Paul. But these shorter books were written to address just one single issue, just one simple point. But just because they're short doesn't mean that they are any less valuable. We truly believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And this promise holds true for these short books of the Bible as well. They can be useful to us. They were included by God in His canon of Scripture for a reason. And in this series, we're striving to figure out what that reason is and what that one point is in these wonderful short books. Last week, Jeff did an excellent job helping us to see the one point in Paul's letter to Philemon. We saw the importance of forgiveness and reconciliation in all of our relationships, especially with those people within the household of God. 
And this week, we are going to be looking at 2 John. So if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app, let me encourage you to open that up to 2 John so that you have God's Word in front of you. It's almost all the way at the back of your Bible, so you can flick all the way through. If you've hit Revelation, you've gone too far. And like all the letters in the New Testament, we only get to listen to one side of the conversation. It's like when you're in the room with somebody and they're on a phone call. You hear what they're saying, you hear their reactions and their responses, and your mind then tries to fill in the blanks about what the other person is saying. And so with these letters, we need to try and deduce the issues that the author was writing to. The original readers of the letter, the original recipients, would have understood the context in which the letter was being received, but we don't have that information, so we need to do some investigating. But let me give you a clue right at the start. With John's second letter, he's writing to address one main issue, and that is the heresy of docetism. Docetism is a big word, but before I define what that fancy word is, I want to remind you of a couple more things, a couple of digital resources that we have for you. We have something called Dwell. That is a Bible audio app that allows you to listen to scriptures on the go. And we've put these one-point wonder books into a single playlist so you can listen to them while you're driving to work or while you're doing your chores. If you were to listen to Second John on the Dwell audio app, it will take about one minute and 58 seconds. So if you're able to blink with your ears, you might miss a bit. So you might want to listen a couple of times to it, but it only takes just under two minutes. We also have Right Now Media, which is like the Netflix of discipleship. It's filled with video content to help you grow in your faith, and we've put some resources together in our FBCC playlists uh, to help you dig deeper into these short books of the Bible. And you can sign up for both of these resources for free thanks to the generous donations of our church family. All you need to do is visit fbclovis.com forward slash dwell to sign up for dwell and fbclovis.com forward slash right now to sign up for right now media. It is that simple. Or if you have the church app, it's even easier. Open up the church app, click the resources tab at the bottom, and you'll see a link for dwell, a link for right now media. You can click on there and sign up through that as well. But let me go back to defining that word I mentioned a moment ago. What is docetism? What is docetism? Well, firstly, docetism was a heresy in the early church. You've probably heard that word heresy before, but a heresy is a school of thought or a belief system that stands in opposition to biblical teaching. It goes against the orthodox, doc, orthodox doctrines of the Bible. This wasn't the first heresy that the early church had to deal with, nor was it the last, but this is the heresy that John was writing to address. The word docetism comes from a Greek word, dokin, uh, which means either to seem or to appear. And the heresy of docetism taught that Jesus didn't really come physically in the flesh. It only appeared that way. It only seemed that he appeared in the flesh. They believe that the spirit of the defying Christ descended on a man called Jesus at his baptism, and then just before Jesus died, the spirit of the divine Christ departed. They don't believe that Jesus ever became human, but just inhabited a human to communicate, communicate with us. And this all stemmed from a growing school of thought at the time, which has another fancy name, Gnosticism. And that had its roots in Greek and Roman theology, but was more and more accepted by people in the early church. And Gnosticism taught that all physical matter, especially flesh, human flesh, was inherently evil or inherently bad, and only the spiritual was good. And so for Gnostics to believe that the divine spiritual God could become flesh was an impossible thought for them. And so they came up with this idea that it only appeared as if God came in the flesh, though he really, really didn't become human. But why does this matter? This is a question a lot of people ask when it comes to these debates over theological questions. Does it matter whether Jesus actually came in the flesh or that he just seemed to be in the flesh? Does it actually change anything? Well, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus did his miracles and helped all those people. It doesn't change any of Jesus' teachings on how we are to live as Christians. 
but it would drastically change the gospel, so much so that the gospel can no longer save us. If Jesus didn't become fully human, then he couldn't live a perfect human life from his birth, which he needed to do to be able to be the perfect sacrifice for us. If Jesus wasn't fully human, then he really couldn't die on the cross for our sins. He couldn't bear the penalty that our sins deserve. And if Jesus didn't really become a human and the spirit of Jesus departed before the death of Jesus took place, then who rose from the grave? The resurrection couldn't happen if Jesus wasn't fully human. And if there's no resurrection, then that is bad news. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. So this issue really matters. And I expect it mattered even more to John on a personal level because John saw Jesus with his own eyes. He knew Jesus. He loved Jesus. He'd been loved by Jesus. John was there for Jesus' miracles and teachings. John was watching from the foot of the cross as Jesus died. John was the first disciple to run to the empty tomb and to go inside it. And John spent many days with Jesus after his resurrection. And so this issue of docetism increasing in the church is why John is writing this letter. He also references the issue in 1 John as well, though it's not his only point in that book. 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. So that's the issue that John is writing to address. Let me read this short letter to you, and then we'll dig deeper into it. This is 2 John. The elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children whom I love in the truth, And not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one that we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. So we're going to look at this letter in three small sections. Firstly, the greeting of truth in verses 1 through 3. Then the commandment to love in verses 4 through 6. And then the reason to walk in truth and love in verses 7 through 10. So let's begin with the greeting of truth. And as with all these New Testament letters, the letter begins by telling us who the author is and who the recipient is. Now, we're not told specifically that this letter was written by the Apostle John. The author just introduces himself as the elder. And the reason that we believe that this was written by John is because this letter had been quoted in very early Christian writings about within a few decades of John writing it, and they all attributed the work and ascribed the work to the apostle himself. And so that's why we believe it was written by John. And just as nonspecific as the author is, the recipient of this letter is simply described as the lady, 
to the lady chosen by God and to her children. Now, this address is not thought to be written to a specific lady and to her children. Rather, it is written to the lady, the bride of Christ, the church as a whole. And the children of that lady are the believers in the church. And so this is considered a general letter or a general epistle written by the Apostle John, not to address a specific issue in a specific congregation. Rather, this was written to address all Christians since this heresy of docetism was spreading far and wide. But John clearly has an agenda right from the beginning of this greeting. Let me read the greeting to you again, and I want you to hear how many times he uses the word truth. I'll actually read verses 1 through 4. The elder to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. So in these four verses, John uses the word truth five times. He is deliberately emphasizing this theme. Now, some people might think this is just a pet topic of John that he likes to talk about. It's been noted by quite a few of you that I I make a lot of my analogies about gardening and composting. Um, And that's all because of starting our vegetable garden during the COVID lockdowns. I'm sure it's crossed many of your minds that our new resource center opening soon is called Deep Roots. It's just how my mind thinks. And John loves this topic of truth, not just in this letter either. You look look at the gospel that John wrote and just see the number of times that he references this topic of truth. Matthew and Mark both use the word truth three times not very much at all. Luke doubles that to six times. He uses, mentions uh, the topic of truth six times. But in John's gospel, he uses the word truth 32 times. And John's gospel is only 21 chapters long. But I think this is more than just a passion topic for John. I think he sees truth at the very heart of the nature of who God is and at the very heart of the work of the gospel. Let me just highlight a few verses from John's gospel to us. He describes firstly the Father as truth in John 17, 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He describes the Son as truth in John 1.14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Or in John 14.6, Jesus describes Himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He describes the Spirit as truth in John 15, 26. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And in John 16, 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. And then John also describes that truth saves us in chapter 832. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he also writes that we grow or we're sanctified by truth in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. For John, truth isn't just some pet topic. He sees it as something essential to the nature of the Godhead and to the nature of the gospel. And so this letter was written as a general letter to Christians scattered around the various cities, and John begins by emphasizing the importance of and his love for truth. But that's not his only emphasis in this letter. Let's now look at the second section, the commandment to love. And let me reread verses 4 through 6 for us. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. 
And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. And so the emphasis in these three verses shifts. He only mentions truth one time. But there are two words which he mentions three times each. Love is the obvious one, but the other one, other one is walk. That's why the album for the second John cover has this guy walking. It seems like a strange word to emphasize, but I think it really defines how we are to think about this topic of love, but we'll come back to that in a moment. John writes that he's not giving his readers a new commandment for them to follow. Rather, he's just re-emphasizing and reminding them of the commandment that has been taught from the beginning of the church age, taught to them by Jesus himself, that we love one another. And Jesus gave this command in John 13. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Earlier this year, we looked at this commandment in our 2-3 principle series, where we're looking at all the one another commands in the New Testament. And this one was, we are to love one another as we think surpassingly of one another. But remember, Jesus says that this is his new command. This is different from the Old Testament command to love your neighbor as yourself. And this, new, this is a new command because the standard of the command has changed. Jesus doesn't command his followers to love one another in the way that we love ourselves. That standard isn't high enough. Rather, Jesus says that we are to love one another as he has loved us. Jesus' love for us is our standard for how we are to love one another, and that is a high benchmark standard to set. And that is the command that John is writing to remind the church of. But he wants to define what that love is. And defining what love, what this love is, is the main reason why John is writing. And defining what love is is still a struggle in our culture and even in the church today. What does it mean to love? What does it look like for somebody to love somebody? What does it look like for us not to be loving? John doesn't define love as a feeling. He doesn't define it as acceptance or tolerance. He doesn't define it as affirming. He writes, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his command. Love is so much more than a feeling. Loving one another involves us living in obedience to all that Jesus commanded. When we live as Jesus calls us to live, that's when we are most loving to one another. And if we are disobedient to Jesus in any way, the result will be that we are not loving. And that goes for all our relationships. The most loving thing you can do for your spouse is to obey Jesus' commands and to grow in that obedience. The most loving thing you can do for your kids is to obey Jesus' commands and to grow in that obedience. The most loving thing you can do for your non-Christian friend or co-worker is to obey Jesus' commands and to grow in that obedience. And I think that's why John uses the word walk as a description for how we are to live. He says we are to walk in truth, we are to walk in obedience, and we are to walk in love. And I think this carries two connotations for us. Firstly, you can't walk by standing still. You have to move your feet. You have to take step after step. So it is with loving one another. We can't just stand still. We have to do something to love others. We need to obey Jesus' commands to love others well. And when you walk, you are going somewhere. You're headed to a destination. And so when we walk in love, we don't just want to keep going in a circle, not going anywhere, staying at our current level of love. Rather, we want to walk to our destination of loving more like Jesus did and growing in that love. And so John has started this letter by emphasizing these two truths, well, truth and walking in love. And in this final section, he gives us the reason for us to walk in truth and love. Let me reread verses 7 through 11 for us. 
I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. So there, right at the beginning of verse 7, we get the key to understanding this letter. Just four words, I say this because. And the reason John has started his letter writing about these emphasis, emphases of uh, truth and love is not just because they're nice topics to discuss. He's writing them for a reason. And that reason goes back to the heresy of docetism that we spoke about earlier. There were people who were going out into the world and teaching that Jesus Christ didn't come in the flesh. Just like the Apostle Paul traveled from city to city, proclaiming the good news and planting churches, so these false teachers were going from city to city to these different churches that had been planted and teaching them that Jesus Christ didn't really come in the flesh. And John doesn't mince his words about these people. He says that they are deceivers and that they are the Antichrist. Now hold on. John has just finished talking about how we are to be loving to one another. We are to love one another just as Christ loved us. And then in the next breath, he goes and calls people names. He calls them deceivers. He says they're tricksters and they're liars. And that they are the antichrist. He's saying the spirit of Satan is upon them. That doesn't seem very loving, does it? Instead of writing letters and calling people names, surely John could call people together for a conversation so they could listen to one another. Maybe put a, a nice brunch on with some bagels and really hear where people are coming from and trying to find some common ground where they can work from together. But this is where we need to let the Bible define what love is instead of letting the world define what love is. And for John and for all of Scripture, love without truth isn't real love. Love without truth isn't real love. Love without truth is false love. Love without truth is deceptive love. Love without truth is satanic love. Satan isn't against love. Satan is against truth. He is the father of lies. He's happy for people to love one another as long as they stay well away from truth. But love without truth isn't real love. And we can get our minds around this when we think about parenting. I was listening to one of my podcasts the other day and heard about a newer style of parenting that's making some small ripples on various social media platforms. And it's called affirmative parenting. Yeah, the groans, you already know what's coming, don't you? The goal of affirmative parenting is never to say no to your child. I know, right? You always give them what they want to eat. You always let them do what they want to do. And you always let them go to bed when they want to go to bed. My kids were here for the first service and they cheered at that point. The thought is that though they may make some poor choices initially, that they will learn to make the right choices from within themselves. Now, I don't know how that would have gone down with your kids, but that's not an experiment I'm willing to try. It sounds like an absolute nightmare. I mean, how many days of school would your kid miss? All of them, probably. How many boxes of donuts would they go through? How many episodes of Pokemon would they watch? How many hours would they play on video games or be on their phones? Is it loving to affirm every decision? Is it loving to avoid saying no? To truly love our kids, we need to set boundaries for them. To love our kids, we need to teach them that they are not the boss. To love our kids, we need to train them in how to obey us as their parents so that when they're adults, they have learned how they can obey God. And for John, loving one another has to revolve around truth. 
If there's no truth, then there is no love because love without truth isn't real love. And so after warning his readers about this heresy, John gives them three reasons to keep walking in truth and love. Firstly, he says they'll get a reward in verse 8. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. I think just as in our day, it can seem costly sometimes to stick to the truth. But John is encouraging them to have an eternal perspective that no matter what they lose in this world, when they hold to the truth, they will be eternally rewarded and fully so. Secondly, they will get the Father and the Son. That's in verse 9. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And when we, so when we continue in the teaching, when we continue in the truth about God, we will have both the Father and the Son because the Father and the Son are both of the truth. And then his third reason for warning them is so that they don't accidentally end up helping to spread this heresy. Verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. So Christians in the early church were often encouraged to offer hospitality to these traveling preachers who would go from city to city. They were often invite, encouraged to invite them into their homes for meals or even to have a place to stay. But John warns that if they offer hospitality to these false teachers, that they are inadvertently sharing in their wicked work. So, that is John's short letter. It's his shortest by verse count. It's only 13 verses, though Third John, which we're going to look at next week, uh, has fewer words in the original Greek, so it's considered this John's shortest letter. But his one point in this letter is that the church needs to walk in truth and love. As we've seen in, uh, in this letter, love without truth isn't real love. And I think we can flip that to say truth without love isn't real truth. We need to walk on this narrow way of truth and love, no matter what the issue is. And in our day, you're going to struggle to find many people who staunchly follow the heresy of docetism. There aren't major Bible teachers around the world teaching that Jesus Christ didn't fully come in the flesh. This heresy was dealt with in the first couple of hundred years of church history. But we still face different issues today where we need to walk in both truth and love. And while we could talk about lots of different issues, I think one issue where the church is getting accused most often about not being loving is with the whole topic of sexuality and gender. Our culture more and more so declares that they are being loving when they accept people for who they are when they affirm people for however they want to identify and whoever they want to be in relationship with, then our world sees that as the epitome of being loving. And they point the finger at Christians who strive to follow the truths of Scripture and say that we are not being loving, we are being hateful. But we need to remember that we can't let the world define what love is. We need to let Scripture define what love is for us. For the world, love equals acceptance. It, it means affirmation and all those things. But for Christ followers, love equals truth. But we need to be careful. Sins around homosexuality and transgenderism aren't worse sins than any other sins. They're the same as lying and stealing and adultery and all the rest. But the struggle that we have is Nobody is asking us to support and encourage those other sins. No one is requiring us to support Stealing Pride Month or encouraging us to attend an adultery rights march. But we are being asked to celebrate something that goes against the teachings of Scripture, that goes against the design of our Creator, that goes against truth. And as Christ followers, we just can't do that. 
if we are affirming and accepting of those who choose these sinful lifestyles, and while it might look like love to the world, it isn't real love. And so, how are we to respond in this culture which is increasingly hostile to the truths of Scripture with which we are to love people? Well, firstly, if you are someone who experiences same-sex attraction or homosexual desires, or if you're someone who wrestles with the topic of gender identity, then I can imagine that this is a really hard message to listen to. And I expect you've got a really hard wrestle between what you see Scripture teaches and how you feel inside. And I expect that you've probably never shared those thoughts or feelings with someone before. Or if you have, it's not been with somebody in the church. And you probably feel really alone and trapped. Well, please know that you are welcome here. And while others may not struggle in the same way as you do, each and every one of us struggles with desires that go against God's design for us, how God created us to be. And that's exactly what sin is. And so if you would like to talk to someone about this, then please don't hesitate to reach out. I know that would be a hard conversation to initiate, a really difficult conversation to have. But I promise you that you will receive no judgment and that there are some fantastic resources to help you reflect on how the gospel shapes us and molds us and transforms us in this particular area. So please don't hesitate to reach out. But for those who don't specifically struggle in this area, rather you struggle to know how to live in this culture, then let me remind you of a couple of things. Firstly, as I've been saying throughout this message, love without truth isn't real love. The only way we can truly love people is with the truth of Scripture. This doesn't mean we bash people over the head with Bible verses, but also we shouldn't shy away from the truth of Scripture or be embarrassed by it. God's truth is good news for our souls. It is good news for the world, even if they don't see it. And second, we need to keep an eternal perspective. Depending on your work environment or the media that you listen to, this topic can seem overwhelming. And for some of you, there will be an increasing risk to stand on God's truth, to stand on the truth of God's Word. It could cost you relationships, even even with dearly loved ones, dear family members. It could cost you your job or your income. It could cost you your reputation. But John encouraged his readers to continue in the truth so that they will be fully rewarded. We need to keep eternity in mind so that the costs of following Christ in this world will be vastly outweighed by the reward that awaits us in his eternal kingdom. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are the God of truth, that everything you do is true and good, and all your words are true and all your promises are faithful. We thank you, Father, that we have the truth of the gospel that saves us and sanctifies us, and we thank you that the truth of the gospel, that Jesus came in the flesh full of grace and truth, that he lived the perfect life so that he could die the death that we deserve to die. And we thank you, Jesus, that your sin, that your death on the cross fully paid for all of our sin and that you rose again from the grave. We thank you. We praise you for your truth. And we ask that you would help us as we live in this world trying to walk this narrow way of truth and love, when so much of our culture declares that we are unloving, when we stick to your truth, we feel in conflict, Father. 
but I pray that you would help us to trust in you, to trust in your word, knowing that your word is good for us and good for everyone, even if we don't see it. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to live with eternity in mind, that we'd be willing to stick to the truth, even if it costs us, because we know your ways are best and your ways are good. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.